polarization instabilities due to channelopathies and on the intersection really between repolarization and calcium cycling. And he'll tell us today about Circa as a possible therapeutic target. So take it away. Should I start? Yes, yes go ahead. Sorry. Just share your screen. The screen is not, okay, screen shared. You have to share the screen. Okay. There you is go. it on? Okay. Yes. It's, it's shared now. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this very uh, uh, famous seminar series. And the, the topic I want to deal with today is, is uh, therapeutic circa enhancement, why and how. Uh, just because this is a very uh, strongly debated uh, topic, and I want to express my opinion about the story. So uh, circa is a central player in EC coupling. It sits in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. It's actually the mechanism controlling the partition of calcium between cytosol and the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, is the, uh, the, me the mechanism doing so because the other uh, mechanism of calcium clearance from the cytosol, the sodium calcium exchanger, actually extrudes calcium uh, from the cell to the extracellular environment and competes with circa for the same calcium pool. Circa is physiologically restrained by a protein called phospholamban, uh, which is uh, phosphorylated by mm, chemkinase 2 and PKA. And when this happens, phospholamban dissociates from circa, thus relieving its inhibition. So phospholamban is the main negative controller of circa activity. Um, Circa controls the calcium content of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which determines largely the amplitude of calcium transients. And this activity sets the amount of overall cell calcium that is required to sustain a given calcium transient amplitude. So it's a very important mechanism. Calcium is uh, then released by rionidine receptors whose open probability uh, depends on both cytosolic calcium and the luminal uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium, as we will say. So uh, the, the talk today is about enhancement of the function of circa and uh, its potential uh, pro versus antiarrhythmic effect. Why uh, are we interested in uh, uh, enhancing and modulating circa? Because circa loss of function is a consistent feature of heart failure common to all etiology. It contributes to systolic and diastolic dysfunction, is arrhythmogenic, it decreases the energetic efficiency of excitation contraction coupling, it may contribute to calcium induced hypertrophic remodeling on the long run. So circa loss of function has a large number of negative effects. And most of them or all of them depends on the loss of intracellular calcium compartmentation. Uh, and I just told you that Circa is main, the main machinery controlling such compartmentation. However, there are some reasons for which we would not want to modulate Circa, especially to stimulate Circa. And uh, the first concern is that Circa gain of function might increase myocardial oxygen consumption, which might be a problem, for instance, in ischemic heart disease. And the second reason, and possibly the most uh, um, claimed, is that an increase in sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium load will facilitate calcium, uh, the, the opening of radion in the receptor, thus facilitating arrhythmogenic calcium release. As you see in this famous graph from Georgi and Georgi, uh, the probability of opening of radion in the receptors depends on cytosolic calcium, but this effect is amplified by an increase in calcium in the lumen of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these two uh, calciums are interplaying in uh, deciding whether rionidine receptor op receptors open easily or with more difficulty. I will start uh, by discussing the first of these two concerns and by showing you this slide from uh, a study of Sakat et al. Uh, in 2007, in which they uh, analyzed uh, the effect of overexpressing circa on oxygen consumption, specifically by calcium handling. And this was in rats. 
uh, as uh, you see, this graph shows the uh, uh, oxygen consumption as a function of uh, maximum elastance. This is the air contractility of, of the, uh, the muscle. And uh, uh, you see, uh, this is the sham animals. And uh, they also tried aortic bending, which is a condition of mechanical overload which sharply increases the oxygen consumption required from calcium handling. And then they superimposed uh, CERCA overexpression. And you see that overexpressing CERCA actually decreases the steepness of this relationship below the sham level, from the aortic bending level to below the sham level. Therefore, it, it is clear that overexpression of CERCA preserves energy instead of increasing energy. And uh, uh, we can easily figure out why. And this is because calcium transport per ATP molecule consumed uh, uh, is one to one if calcium is handled by the sodium calcium exchanger and two to one if the calcium is handled by circa. And I uh, shortly ago told you that the two mechanisms compete for the same calcium pool. Now let's go to the other concern. Um, which dates back to the finding that digitalis toxicity, that the digitalis proarrhythmic effect was due to calcium overload. So calcium overload has become almost a synonym of uh, arrhythmias induced by uh, spontaneous calcium release events, even if it should not. Uh, I give you here just an example of uh, a late finding which goes back to that uh, uh, conception. Uh, in this work by Hachin Esal of, of the Manchester group, uh, PD5 inhibition uh, is, was proven to be antiarrhythmic uh, uh, in, in long QT syndrome. And this results is, resulted from prevention of calcium waves, as you can see here. And this is the, uh, the current underlying delayed after the polarization. And this action of uh, uh, sildenafil uh, was associated with, with a remarkable decrease in the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium content. And the right uh, slide shows that there is a correlation between the decrease in calcium content in the SR and the antiarrhythmic activity of sildenafil. Here are the cell which still had waves on the sildenafil, and these are the cells which had no waves after sildenafil and you see that the SR content is lower in the latter. So from, from this evidence, the authors concluded that PD5 inhibition is antiarrhythmic anti precisely because it reduces the calcium in the SR, hinting to the fact that high calcium in the SR may be poor arrhythmic. However, I want to point out that sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium overload it is not a general feature of conditions with uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum instability. Another question is how is circamy stimulation expected to affect sarcoplasmic reticulum stability in general? Uh, to make my point, I, I need to, uh, to use tools that we have been extensively using in, in later years uh, that uh, I ask you to uh, assume in good faith that, that they do what, what I tell you they do, and then I'll come back to them and show you that this is the case. So Istaroxim is, is a drug that we have uh, described uh, many years ago, which has a dual effect. It's a sodium potassium pump blocker, just like Digitalis, but at the same time, we were able to show that it's a circa stimulator. And by comparing the effect of this drug to the effect of digoxin, we have a very nice situation in which we can, we, we, uh, uh, can uh, analyze how the cells respond to calcium overload induced by sodium potassium pump blockade, plus or minus circa stimulation, which is afforded by esteroxin and not by digoxin. So we start from the worst case in which we have an example in which there is calcium overload and let's see what happens when we simultaneously stimulate circa. So in this slide, uh, we analyzed how esteroxim and digoxin inhibit the sodium potassium pump in a dose in a concentration dependent fashion. In, uh, in this species, this, which is guinea pig, 
Uh, Isteroxime is slightly less potent than digoxin in inhibiting the sodium potassium pump. Nonetheless, we can identify concentrations of the two drugs at which the uh, level of sodium pump inhibition is similar. And if we take this couple of concentrations and we plot them here in terms of the incidence of spontaneous after contractions corresponding to spontaneous calcium release events that were recorded under these two drugs, we see that for any pair of these concentrations, the incidence of after contractions is smaller for isteroxime than for digoxin. And this implies that, in, that simulation of circa is able to overcome the proarrhythmic effect of increase in SR calcium load. This is even more significant if we consider instead of looking at the sodium potassium pump, we look at the actual inotropic effect of, of uh, the two agents. Here is the change in cell shortening, which is sort of a uh, readout of inotropy. And here again, the incidence of spontaneous con after contractions. And you see that while for digoxin, even a small increase in inotropy is associated with after contractions, for hysteroxine, there is a wide range of uh, increase in, in inotropy that is not associated with the, in, uh, any after contraction incidence. So again, this shows that for the same level of inotropy and sodium potassium pump inhibition, circa stimulation is antiarrhythmic. Now, I, have, I just have this as an example. There are many other results in on animals, and I'll be able also, also to show you patient data uh, later on, uh, supporting the idea that uh, isteroxime is not proarrhythmic. So now we come to a first uh, conclusion, and uh, uh, this is that circa stimulation may actually counter the proarrhythmic effect of increased sarcoplasmic reticulum load. Then the interesting thing is why, if we understand the mechanism, uh, we understand we all might possibly figure out interventions which uh, prevent arrhythmias. And I'll give you four reasons for, uh, for this. Reason one uh, is that as very nicely uh, hypothesized and shown by the Manchester group, uh, the relationship between uh, circa activity expressed uh, here as the rate constant of circa uh, turnover activity. So if you increase here, there is an increase in circa activity is related to the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium content. And as you see here, the relationship is nonlinear, is uh, saturating as you approach the 100% of circa stimulation, which means that uh, above a given level, circa stimulation will induce uh, very minor changes in sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium content. And why is this the case? Because the content of calcium within the SR is under a closed homeostatic loop, uh, which goes as follows. If calcium increases in the sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen, uh, calcium transient amplitude increases. This will lead to a decrease in calcium influx because of calcium independent, uh, sorry, of calcium dependent inactivation of calcium channels. And at the same time, uh, calcium outflux through NCX will be increased because of the increase in driving force. The two things together concord to uh, generate a negative feedback on the content of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is why the relationship flattens down. On the other hand, because opening uh, probability of rionidine receptor increases as the SR content increases, the relationship between circa activity and calcium transient amplitude is pretty linear. And this shows that, that you, you can have a relatively small effect on the SR calcium content, but still a, a, a significant increase in contractility if you stay stimulated circa. The second reason I want to bring to, to my argument uh, is that uh, I mentioned before that the rionidine receptor open probability depends on both cytosolic calcium and SR calcium. But which is the one which matters more for the generation of spontaneous calcium release events. A lot of emphasis has been put by, by work on the content of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, 
but I want to spend a few minutes to show you evidence that cytosolic calcium is also or even more important in uh, determining spontaneous calcium release events. This work by Egdel uh, and co-workers in 2000 shows that this is the case. In this work, they try to establish correlation between calcium SR, uh, in the, in the SAR lumen and calcium in the cytosol and the occurrence of cal spontaneous calcium release events. Here, the reticulum was loaded to different loads by increasing stimulation frequency and then measured. And you can clearly see here that the concentration of uh, 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 SR calcium corresponding to the threshold for wave generation is actually lower than the concentration at a sub-threshold uh, sub -threshold frequency. And when you know, frequency is increased more and load is increased, uh, uh, loading remains about the same, as I told you before, because it saturates. But again, uh, uh, there is not a very uh, clear correlation between uh, calcium in the SR and the incidence of spontaneous calcium release events. On the other hand, uh, whenever the cells had uh, spontaneous calcium release events, the diastolic calcium was always higher, as shown here by an example, and here as the average from multiple cells at different times after the, the, the previous uh, voltage-induced calcium spike. So the, the conclusion from this slide is actually that, uh, that cytosolic calcium is more important in uh, uh, controlling the incidence of calcium release events. Reason number three, uh, in this study, uh, rionidin receptor uh, probability of opening was increased by considering a mutation of rionidin receptor that leads to catecholamine-induced polymorphic ventricular tachycardias. So this is a model of extreme rionidin receptor lability. And you see that in this preparation, uh, calcium waves occurred spontaneously. Now they cross this, this mice with a phospholamba knockout mouse representing an extreme instance of circa activation. If you knock, knock out phospholamba completely, Circa will be strongly activated. And as you see in this slide, there are no more waves. There are only small dots, small wavelets, disorganized wavelets uh, that are generated by an increasing incidence of spark events, of very small events, but you don't see waves. And are actually waves which generate delayed after depolarization and the rhythms. The same, of course, if you uh, increase phospholamban, sorry, if you increase that circ activity by phospholamban knockout uh, in the wild time mouse, you don't see organized waves, you just see uh, more sparks and wavelets. Overall, uh, um, phospholamban knockout, which is circ activation, led to a major decrease in the frequency of triggered events. And this, is, uh, this was largely reverted by circ blockade. And what is the explanation for this unexpected observation? Well, you know, random rionidin receptor opening uh, uh, gives rise to sparse, calcium sparks, which are very small events. And this may contribute to calcium leak, to decrease calcium content of the SR, to increase ATP consumption, which are all bad things, but it will not lead to waves because in order to generate calcium waves and delayed after depolarization, you need uh, a crosstalk between adjacent calcium release units, which is supported by cytosolic calcium propagation. So you do need this crosstalk to generate waves. And if you put circa in the middle of it, uh, you, may, you can clearly, clearly figure out how circa can scoop up calcium in the SR, thus interrupting this propagation and this crosstalk. So it is not difficult to understand how circa activation can actually prevent calcium waves delayed after depolarization and arrhythmias. Uh, very importantly, the, an increased probability of rionidin receptor opening is often considered as a synonym of increased probability of calcium waves, but this is not the case. We have to remember that we need an additional factor, which is the crosstalk between adjacent calcium release units, which is disrupted by 
circuit stimulation. Here is a fourth reason. In this experiment, uh, we again used digoxin and hysteroxin in a different species. Now it's murine myocytes. Uh, we first had to uh, compare the two agents for the ability to inhibit the sodium potassium pump. Uh, and in, 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 in the mice is different than in guinea pigs. So we found that 150 mi uh, micro for uh, digoxin and 20 micro for hyster was, they did the same thing on the pump. And then we use these two concentrations of the two agents to see what happened to cytosolic calcium when we interrupted a, a, a preloading a train of pulses under voltage clamp conditions. And you see that during the pause, uh, digoxin is accompanied by a sharp buildup of calcium in the cytosol, whereas hysteroxin that blocks the sodium potassium pump to the same extent of this concentration. Uh, is for a long time associated with no rise in cytosolic calcium. And this is clearly, it clearly describes the effect of, of uh, additional circa activation on the ability to compartmentalize calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen, thus clearing it from cytosol. This is an example. This is the results from many cells. And this is the impact on the transmembrane current mostly carried by sodium calcium exchanger that corresponds to these two different calcium levels in the cytosol. So the concept here is that circuit stimulation may strongly increase compartmentation of calcium within the SR, thus removing it from the cytosol. Uh, it is interesting because when it's in the cytosol, calcium can recruit dangerous partners. And this is shown in this slide. And this study is a recent study by Yan and co-workers. Uh, they tested the effect of JNK2, which is a kinase, is a stress kinase activated by alcohol. Uh, you know that alcohol facilitates uh, atrial fibrillation and they were interested in finding out the mechanism. It turns out that this kinase simultaneously activates chem kinase 2 and circa by uh, direct phosphorylation. Sorry, yes, by direct phosphorylation. Now look at uh, what this, this, this uh, uh, kinase does on the relationship between content of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the tetrachyne sensitive leak, which is a measure of rionidine receptor opening probability. If you use this, uh, this uh, kinase alone, which activates both chem kinase and circa at the same time, you see that there is a remarkable increase in a, a tetrachyne sensitive leak uh, when uh, uh, calcium content is increased. However, if you dissociate the two effects by blocking chem kinase, uh, you see that the, 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 uh, the, same, the same kinase only increases the SR content without increasing uh, the leak very much. And this implies that the increase in leak which is associated sometimes with uh, increased calcium content, uh, requires uh, uh, recruitment of chem kinase 2. It's not necessarily related to circuit stimulation. Uh, this would be prevented by an increased calcium compartmentation because calcium wouldn't be many more in the cytosol, and therefore calcium kinase activation might be reduced. Uh, the conclusion we draw from, from all these this, uh, evidences is that a recovery of circ activity may be antiarrhythmic because it improves calcium confinement within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which means increasing calcium in the SR at the expense of calcium in the cytosol. And this uh, uh, leads to uh, a limitation of calcium diffusion between adjacent calcium release units, then this prevents calcium waves and may also prevent, of course, calcium kinase activation, uh, which has a strong effect on rayon and receptor open probability. Two things together probably concoct to reduce calcium wave generation. So now let's uh, switch gears and, and, and go to uh, how to stimulate circa. It is not a, an easy task. Uh, we can achieve it uh, by two means. One is increasing circa expression in the cell, and the, cell, the, cell, the other one is increasing the function of the already expressed circa. 
Increasing surrogate expression has been attempted by gene transfer. And this was the Cupid trial, uh, which failed not because the principle was wrong, but simply because gene transfer implies viral transfection, which is a very complex thing, very expensive and very complex, and can be uh, nullified by the uh, immune response of the recipient. However, nowadays, we can also increase circa function, not by anything requiring viral transfer, uh, but by drugs, just small molecules. And now we have uh, two kinds of uh, circa stimulators. Uh, some of them directly stimulate uh, the HEPAs, and uh, here is a paper by Cornia and co-workers uh, in 13. But uh, we also uh, are able to stimulate circa by antagonizing the effect of phospholamine. Phospholamine is an inhibitor of circa. If we antagonize phospholamine, we end up increasing circa function. And I will focus uh, on this approach just because it's our approach. So phospholamine antagonists. Uh, Isteroxim is the drug that I mentioned you before. is a sodium potassium pump blocker, but it is also endowed with circa stimulated activity. And this is the demonstration of it in, in guinea pig myocytes. In, the, in these experiments, we, under voltage clamp conditions, emptied the SR with a caffeine pulse and then reloaded it with a series of uh, uh, depolarizing steps. And during these steps, we recorded the calcium transients and an increase in calcium transient amplitude at every step reflects an increase in the replenishment of the SR. Notably, the experiments were performed under conditions in which uh, the sodium calcium exchanger was disabled, uh, therefore uh, nullifying the action uh, on the sodium potassium pump because the sodium potassium pump acts through the sodium calcium exchanger by changing its reversal potential. And this protocol allows to test um, calcium uptake at multiple calcium load within the SR. What happens during this protocol with, with, with the uh, hysteroxin? We tested it in, in sham animals. And here you see the calcium transient amplitude build up during the protocol, which is made faster by the drug. Uh, here you see the decay time of every transient uh, along the pulse protocol. And you see that it is made shorter by the drug, uh, again, uh, showing that there is an increase in calcium uptake rate. And this is the gain of calcium-induced calcium release, uh, which depends uh, on mostly on the content of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which was increased by the drug. The buildup rate was increased. This effect was relatively small in the sham animal, but was substantially a significant increase in the, in the same animal after aortic bending, which is a heart failure mode. And this denotes a very interesting property of, of this drug in that it, 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 and it is that it acts much better in, in, uh, in disease condition than in, in normal ones. Uh, how does hysteroxim uh, stimulate circa? This is a study in an heterologous expression system in microsomes in which circa TPA's activity was assayed in the presence of different calcium concentrations, and the calcium dependency of CERC activity was measured in control and in the presence of, uh, of the drug. Uh, in a system where CERCA was the only expressed protein, you see that the drug had no effect, uh, whereas when phospholamine was added to the preparation, then the effect of the drug in increasing uh, the uh, CERCA ATPase activity uh, clearly appeared. And this uh, suggests that the, uh, the, the way by which hysteroxim activates circa is phospholamine dependent. And there are further studies that I cannot show you in the sake of time that uh, show that actually uh, uh, hysteroxim prevents co-precipitation of phospholamine and circa. So hysteroxim is effectively a phospholamine antagonist. Has this any relevance uh, in vivo? Uh, well, there are several in vivo experiments, but probably the best one is in humans. Uh, Isteroxim has already been tested in clinical studies, at least in a couple of them. This is the most recent one, in which uh, in a double-blind randomized versus placebo a study of 24 hours infusion of Isteroxim in, in heart failure 
uh, near class three, four patients, uh, echocardiogram was uh, um, performed and hemodynamics were assessed by, by this examination. Uh, you see here that uh, esteroxim during the infusion was uh, able to increase stroke volume significantly as compared to placebo and to, e to decrease the E over E prime ratio, which is when it goes down, it, it is an index of improvement of diastolic function. So esteroxim had both inotropic and a positive lusitropic effect. These effects were not due to changes in afterload because blood pressure didn't change significantly during the infusion period. And most importantly, was not associated to any proarrhythmic effect. Here, uh, for simplicity, I only show you the number of PVCs in the 24 hours. This is from baseline uh, to infusion in placebo, and this is from baseline to infusion in esteroxin. If anything, there is a slight decrease in the incidence of PVCs, certainly not an increase. So, esteroxin again increased, uh, uh, sorry, blocked the sodium potassium pump which per se has a proarrhythmic effect, but still was able to have an hemodynamic effect without increasing arrhythmias. I think this is very significant. Well, then, you know, we, we did uh, pharmacokinetics uh, of, uh, of esteroxim in these patients. And esteroxim is a very bad drug pharmacokinetically uh, because it has a very short half-life. When uh, uh, infusion is discontinued, esteroxin concentration drops almost immediately to zero. Very short of life. However, the main metabolite of esteroxin, which is called PSC 1393, accumulates to a much larger extent during infusion of an esteroxin, and it, it, it decays much more slowly, just because uh, it, this, this 1393 misses the amino function that is cleaved by enzymes that degrade esteroxin. So PS3 does not have the amino function and, and then is therefore uh, metabolized much more slowly. So beca we became quite interested in seeing whether, in looking at whether this 1393 had uh, an effect on itself. And uh, here is uh, again microsomes. Uh, let's start from the uh, right panel. Uh, circa 1 was expressed uh, alone, and this is the KD for calcium. If you s an increase in this, uh, there is a decrease in, in circa function. So when we added phospholamban to the circa preparation, there was uh, an increase in KD, which means circa was downregulated. And when on the top of this, we applied 1393 at increasing concentration, the, uh, the, the phospholamban effect was killed and circa function was uh, recovered. Uh, when all this was done in the absence of phospholamban, the drug had no effect, again showing that also the effect of 1393 depends on phospholamban. It's again phospholamban antagonism. What about sodium potassium pump blockade? Uh, very interestingly, this compound, uh, as compared to esteroxim, which is this curve, had almost no effect on the sodium potassium pump. So here we have a pure circuit stimulator with no sodium potassium inhibiting effect. Besides the therapeutic interest of this compound, it is a very nice tool to, uh, to run experiments to pharmacologically stimulate circa uh, uh, in isolation and see what happens. So, of course, we also use these compounds in cell experiments. This is the same experiment I showed you for esteroxin. Uh, we ran this experiment in a disease model, which is the streptozotocin-induced diabetes in rats. And you see that diabetes uh, brings, you know, this curve down, uh, uh, the calcium transitive, uh, calcium transit amplitude curve down brings the gain of uh, excitation contraction coupling down. It prolongs the time constant of calcium decay, all signs of deteriorated sarcoplasmic reticulum function. And when you apply the drug, the drug is actually able to revert all the, uh, the, all the changes induced by the disease. So again, uh, 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 amelioration of sarcoplasmic reticulum function. Has it an impact on, on hemodynamics? 
this is the effect of the disease that is diabetes. And you see that ejection fraction was reduced, fractional shortening was down, a systolic index was down, and uh, an index of diastolic function was also compromised. And uh, when we applied the drug, all these indexes were dose dependently ameliorated by 1393. So the, the disease effect were reversed by, by 1393. Um, Okay, let's go to humans. We don't have clinical data about 1393 yet, but uh, thanks to a collaboration with the Hamburg, book, uh, the Hamburg uh, group, Arne Hansen and Thomas Eschenhagen, we recently co uh, collected data from IPS, human IPS, uh, cardiomyocytes. And uh, uh, here you see the effect of 1393 applied to these myocytes on, on calcium transient properties. Calcium transient amplitude was unchanged, and in most, as in most of our studies, uh, however, the time to peak of the calcium transient, which, re which reflects the rate of calcium efflux from the from the reticulum, uh, was reduced uh, by the drug highest concentration significantly, which indicates probably that DSR was more replenished uh, by the drug. And the uh, half time of decay of calcium during the transient was reduced, which again points to an enhanced function of SR uptake of calcium, whereas the uh, con uh, concentration of calcium in the content of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum was basically unchanged. So this is a confirmation that the drug is active also in human uh, cells. In this same study, we had a sort of uh, serendipitous but very useful uh, um, evidence. And this is that uh, there was a fairly wide scatter of the contours uh, of calcium transients. And this probably reflects immaturity of these cells. So the, the, they are structurally immature, circa is not fully active in all cells. And this gives us a range of different calcium transient profiles. Uh, we decided to use two parameters. One is the uh, rise time and the other one is the decay time constant. And when we plotted the various cells, the various profiles according to these two parameters, uh, we found that they nicely uh, uh, clustered. And by using boundaries decided on these clusters, we generated distribution of calcium transient profiles. And you see here the distribution that we observed under control conditions. And you see that PSC 1393 changes the distribution significantly by uh, enhancing the representation of type two transients. And type two transients are the most hyperkinetic ones, the one which have the sharpest rise and the fastest decay. Again, compatible with circa stimulation. We were not happy with it. Uh, this, this is not enough. We went to test the rate dependency of uh, calcium transient properties. Uh, we stimulated the cells at different rates, three points at each rate. You see the amplitude decrease as stimulation rate was increased. That is a negative staircase, which is common in IPS cardiomyocytes, again, because of their immaturity. Uh, the drug exerted only a minor, not significant effect on calcium transient amplitude. Nonetheless, look at the time to peak. Time to peak was uh, longer in the beginning in, in the control than in the drug treated cells. Uh, it went down during the increasing rate. Uh, if we apply the drug, the T peak was so short in the beginning that the curve was flat. It did, uh, didn't undergo any further change during stimulation. What about diastolic calcium, which is of course uh, very much affected by how fast calcium is reuptaken by the SR. And you see here that under control condition, there was a clear buildup of calcium with increasing rate. So more calcium in the cytosol when the rate goes up. Whereas this was not the case when the drug was applied, the curve was uh, practically flat. Again, a sign of, uh, of increased, of improved calcium uptake by the SR. So uh, I come to, uh, to uh, conclusions at this point. Um, the initial question whether uh, SR stimulation uh, may facilitate or prevent arrhythmias uh, from the evidence I presented you and the mechanisms that I tried to um, 
uh, to um, make uh, responsible of, of this effect. Uh, it doesn't facilitate arrhythmias. If anything, it prevents arrhythmias. And uh, uh, at the same time, is it able to uh, improve inotropy and lusitropy in our failure? Yes, and this comes from clinical studies as well. I tell you that we were somewhat surprised to find that circa stimulation alone could improve inotropy. We were convinced that it would modulate the lusitropy only, but it turned out it also increases inotropy. And this uh, may also be due to the coupling of inotropy and lusitropy in in vivo conditions in the whole heart. You know that uh, relaxation and contraction are mechanically coupled. Anyway, it turns out to be a decent inotrope as well. And uh, uh, can circ enhancement be uh, selectively achieved by drug therapy? Uh, yes, uh, we are on, on our way to, to, uh, uh, to obtain drugs that, can, that are clinically usable and can, uh, can achieve that without requiring any uh, gene transfection uh, procedure or uh, very expensive uh, and difficult means. Uh, and with this, uh, I, I conclude. I, I would like to acknowledge the contribution uh, to the data that I presented. Uh, we, we received funding from uh, CV Therapeutics and Wintry that uh, own the property of, of Istaroxim and the derivatives. Uh, we have uh, set up in, our, in my institution a joint lab, which means joint uh, uh, enterprise between uh, a company and the university. And uh, this puts together different expertises. Francesco Perry is uh, a synthetic chemist and is now synthesizing new compounds. Marcella Rocchetti uh, collaborates with us in physiology. Mara Ferrandi and Barassi are responsible for biochemical experiments in microsomes. Uh, from the company side, Professor Bianchi and Ferrari and uh, uh, Dr. Chang and Su, uh, did you know coordination and were responsible for the ECO data, and finally the IPS studies that I showed you are in collaboration with the group at uh, UK Hamburg, uh, with Tom, uh, Tom, uh, sorry, um, Arne Hansen and Thomas Schenage. And finally, this is uh, my group today. It's it's a recent uh, image as you see from the masks. Uh, this is not the group that used to be some times ago. So I have a bunch of of young people uh, that uh, I hopefully will contribute a, a lot to, to our next work. Uh, Chiara Florindi is not a, in, in this slide, but it's, uh, at, he, he, she came later on, uh, but she's also an adding to the group uh, right now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm very pleased to, to have your questions. Well, thank you, Antonio, for really a tour de force uh sort of finding your way through many multiple interactions and feedbacks and this is a complicated story but uh, a beautiful one so thank you for your talk which was really excellent thank you uh, i have one question before i look at the chat for questions you know in in heart failure there is a lot of evidence for this array of the calcium release units, the T tubules and the calcium release units. And you said that, uh, if I understood it correctly, the way to prevent arrhythmias through circa is by preventing the formation of calcium waves. But the calcium waves require that organization. If the organization falls apart, apparently there will be no calcium waves even without any intervention. What do you think? Well, I think the evidence suggests that they are there. Uh, heart failure is accompanied with a high incidence of arrhythmias, most resulting from this perturbed calcium handling by spontaneous calcium release events. I think that, that that's well established. Well, I, I wonder if there is a difference, you know, not all heart failures are the same. And there are some that have a disarray of the calcium system and some don't. I wonder if there is a difference in arrhythmogenicity between these two types. Maybe the ones that don't yeah. have, uh, those that preserve some order of the calcium system are more arrhythmogenic. I don't know the answer. I don't know that anybody. I don't know either. I don't have the answer for this question. I can yes. point out something. Just, uh, 
Yeah, just a thought after you talk. No, but... no, no. It's 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 a it's a very nice thought. I can give you a sort of clue, maybe. IPS are almost devoid of chi tubules. Yes. So what you saw in in IPS uh, is in the absence of chi tubules. Yeah, but and uh... I actually uh, actually think while well, it's been demonstrated that the absence, I think it's worked by Bill Louch, that absence uh, of T tubules actually impairs the homeostatic mechanisms that controls calcium within the SR. Right. Because there is more distance between uh, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and NCX, so they cannot mm -hmm. communicate very easily. And uh, this uh, uh, increases the probability of wave generation, as a matter of fact. I guess as long as the release units, not the T-tubules, but the release units yeah. are, are yeah. there, they're intact, and they're close enough to allow for diffusion of calcium to form the wave. So I agree, I agree. Conditions that you have to, yeah. Okay, yeah. let me look at the chat. So, let's see. First question is from Guy Salama. Wonderful talk. A major, issue, a major issue that you raised is oxygen consumption, which might be expected to increase during circus stimulation. You showed that did not happen. However, I have to scroll down. However, in conditions where RYR2 is leaky, common effect of reduced metabolism, Calcium release and reuptake by circa would go into a loop. It would be energetically problematic. Heart failure, hypertrophy conditions might not be improved by circa stimulation. Question mark and an exclamation mark both. Okay. Uh, I think it's a very good point. Circa stimulation, the effect of circa stimulation. Uh, on calcium compartmentation may be decreased if the SR is very leaky. Uh, however, keep in mind that calcium in immediate proximity of rionidine receptors on the cytosolic side is very important in increasing the open probability of rionidine receptors. No, no, not necessarily. Not if it's thiol oxidate, oxidative stress, in which case the damn thing opens up with very high open probability and it's not so calcium sensitive at all. This was shown okay. by Cecilia Hidalgo in planar bilayers, that there are two okay. different kinds of RYR2, some that are incredibly active and some that aren't. And most of the ones that are studied are highly active sensitivity to uh, calcium, to magnesium, to ruthenium red. But if you reduce them, if you put them in a normally reduced environment with glutathione in the medium, then they don't respond so much to calcium. They're much, uh -huh. the, the calcium sensitivity is very different. And so is the magnesium and so on. So in a uh -huh. metabolic injury, it, it's very surprising that you wouldn't get a huge increase in oxygen consumption. I, I agree with your point, and uh, the the the, uh, ox the effect on oxygen consumption of circa activation has not been tested in the presence of a leaky SR, and I think it should be done. That's a very good point. Um, I think it's a it's, it's a, a balance uh, of effects. It really depends on how leaky is is the SR, and how circa stimulation is able to remove calcium from the cytosol in the immediate vicinity of rionidine receptors. Keep in mind that cytosolic calcium is also partly responsible for the production of radical oxygen species, which may come from mitochondria, in which high calcium uh, and the consequent high sodium in the cytosol leads to uh, a major uh, impairment of the scavenging system. So by, by reducing mm -hmm. cytosolic calcium, you might end up also affecting the um, uh, the uh, production of radical oxygen species, which you mentioned as the right. main factor uh, affecting rionidine receptor probability. So I think it's, it's, it's a balance between things, but you are right. It has to be tested uh, under because conditions. Because uh, when the rionidine receptor is highly active, it will beat circa. And yeah, that's why the heart, the muscle contracts. 
Yeah. And so yeah, for course. Circa to keep up and to kind of quelch the effects of a leaky RYR2 is very, very difficult. Um, it's a shunt. It's a shunt. Yeah. It's okay. a shunt of uh, thermodynamic shunt <clears throat> yeah. of Circa pumping. So clearly it will increase oxygen consumption by Circa handling. I agree. Okay, next question is from Dario Di Francesco. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio, the intracellular environment of a myocyte is a relatively well-defined closed compartment where all mechanisms involved can be described in detail and quantified. Do you think it would be possible to use a numerical model to account quantitatively for the data that is cellular data you have described. Then he says, grazie. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. I think it would be very interesting. And um, uh, we are not modelers. I think I would have to uh, um, recruit the, the, the um, collaboration of a modeler. And that's, that's something we, have, we already have in mind and we are in the process of doing. Yes, definitely so, it, it can be modeled. It's, it's a typical issue that, that requires numerical modeling because you have many interacting factors and modeling may sort out which are the quantitative contribution of various components. So it might also help to, to, uh, to address uh, Guy's question. Thank you, Dario. Okay, uh, we have a little note from Ana Gomez. Ana says, great talk, Antonio. Thank I you. have to. I have to leave. Ciao. Ciao. Very Italian. <laughs> I'm your slave. <laughs> now, I think that's all we have. Does anybody else has any questions to Antonio? I think people are still digesting it. It's a lot of information. Some really stones to be thrown at me or some... Uh... Yeah, I guess, I guess if, I, if anybody has, I mean, the nice thing about the internet is if you have any questions and afterthoughts, uh, I think you can just email. Of course, of course, and, please and do. Antonio. Yeah, just email Antonio and ask him the questions because it's really a lot of material to absorb and uh, you went systematically from reasons of why it's not a rhythmic to, you know, to continue. There is one from Fadi Akar. Hi, Fadi. Hi, Fadi. Fadi says, fantastic talk, comprehensive and thought provoking. So Fadi, send, send some difficult questions to Antonio. Some ripe tomatoes. We call them ripe tomatoes. <laughs> I have none. It's, it's All right. Great. Well, if uh, there is nothing else, then I will say uh, goodbye. Thank you again to Antonio for a fantastic Thank you. Talk. Thank you to you for and inviting also, me. Yeah, we'll see everybody on October 5th when we have a talk about the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation by Uli Schatten. So we'll see you then. Thank, thank you for you attending me. to the whole uh, audience. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.